intense hail. I literally thought the windshield was going to break on the vehicle. So. Moving toward Turon and New Salem. Tornado safe. April 2011. A month in the United States where 875 tornadoes were confirmed. Almost unseen throughout history. This was a result of tornado outbreaks seemingly every week that ravaged the country. And it all culminated during the final week of April. As if Mother Nature was putting a bow on the month, it unleashed the biggest super outbreak since 1974 as it dropped 360 tornadoes from the 25th to the 28th, with 216 being confirmed on the 27th alone. In this video, we cover two of those. One of them that would produce damage that is reminiscent of the 1997 Gerald tornado. In this video, we dive into the meteorological setup, the storm, and its aftermath. Kevin Nupp said that the conditions leading up to the super outbreak was among the, quote, most conductive to violent tornadoes ever documented. On April 25th, a vigorous upper-level shortwave trough was present that moved into the southern plains states. Ample instability, low-level moisture, and wind shear fueled a significant tornado outbreak from Texas to Tennessee. At least 64 tornadoes touched down on the 25th, a number soon to be dwarfed by the following days. Ingredients for tornadoes still remained plentiful for the 26th, as an area of low pressure consolidated over Texas and traveled east, while the shortwave trough from the previous day traversed the Mississippi River and Ohio River valleys. Another 50 tornadoes touched down on this day. The multi-day tornado outbreak would culminate on the 27th, with the most violent day of tornadic activity since the 1974 super outbreak. Multiple episodes of tornadic activity occurred with two waves of mesoscale convective systems in the morning hours, followed by a widespread outbreak of supercells from Mississippi to North Carolina during the afternoon into the evening. Activity on April 27th was fueled by a strong southwesterly surface jet that was in place, creating storm-relative helicity values to skyrocket, leading to extreme wind shear. Daytime high temperatures of 77 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit and dew points of 66 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit were present. Furthermore, convective available potential energy values reached 3,000 joules per kilogram, which would be enough to fuel the upcoming events. All of the models and meteorologists were predicting the worst possible case scenario, yet it was still an underestimation. In the early AM hours, a massive mesoscale convective system moved through, producing serious straight-line winds. But unlike most MCS, this system produced many tornadoes, majority being violent, destroying many pieces of vital infrastructure and knocking out power across the state of Alabama, leaving hundreds of thousands unable to receive warnings. And in the afternoon, the barrage of supercells came. This is where the real danger would manifest. The storm this video is based on develops at 1.50 p.m. and rapidly matures into a supercell just after 2.30 before it drops its first tornado around 3 p.m. south-southwest of Houston, Mississippi. During its life, the tornado struck and destroyed many homes and businesses, and at its peak, the tornado slabbed a well-built brick home, which signals high-end EF4 to low EF5 damage. However, this area was neglected by NWS surveyors. Had they seen the damage, the tornado would likely be rated at least an EF4 instead of its undeserved EF3 rating. The most interesting story from this tornado was Lynn Davis, who was driving south presumably to escape the tornado. And when he failed to do so, the tornado crashed onto him. His vehicle was picked and carried 1.7 miles before it was slammed back into the ground. Unfortunately, he does not survive. The tornado dissipates near New Wren, leaving behind a 51 mile damage path, killing 4 and injuring 25. After a brief cycle, the storm drops its next tornado. The tornado in the title of this video touches down at 3.42 p.m., 3 miles southwest of the town of Smithville, and almost immediately began flinging trees and reached EF5 intensity after traversing only 2 miles, as it causes ground scouring before plowing into Smithville. The tornado tore through a residential area on the west side of town. It then moved through a business area before exiting through another residential area. The damage was appalling. 
Well-built homes were swept away, leaving a bare foundation. Items of furniture, appliances, or plumbing inside homes on the path was pulverized into dust, or it was sent flying off, never to be found. Some homes had tiles scoured from the foundation. A red SUV was sent flying a half mile, where it would bounce off the Smithville water tower and was carried an additional quarter mile to the opposite side of town, where it would be crumpled into a ball and left unrecognizable. The city hall, post office, four churches, several businesses, the water system, and the police station were all destroyed as the tornado moved through town. Tar and chip pavement was torn from a road and rolled into piles. Intense ground scouring was noted in several areas, and a 1965 Chevrolet pickup truck was thrown from one residence and never found. The tornado left 117 buildings destroyed and damaged another 50, alongside leaving 16 people dead. After exiting Smithville, the tornado began weakening down to a high-end EF-3. It remained as a high-end EF-3 and low EF-4 as it destroyed many homes and mobile homes northeast of Smithville, killing an an additional seven. After moving through a forested area, the tornado erased the forest, flinging and debarking hundreds of trees. The tornado would weaken down to an EF-2 as it entered Alabama, but not before intensifying into an EF-3, destroying several more homes. The tornado would continue through wooded area before lifting south of Hodges at 4.23 p.m., leaving behind 37 miles of destruction. The outbreak would rage on for the remainder of the day and into the 28th. Many towns and cities in Mississippi, and especially Alabama, were in ruins, Smithville included. Many include the Smithville tornado in the same conversation as the Gerald tornado, and it's described by some as a modern-day Gerald, and it's not hard to see why. Some homes that were very well built were reduced to a bare foundation, stripped of debris. Furniture, appliances, were torn to shreds, similar to Gerald. However, unlike Gerald, this tornado did not stall over its affected areas, meaning this tornado would be inflicting the damage it caused in a much shorter time period, signaling that this tornado was extremely strong. However, the NWS criminally underrated this tornado during its Jambit survey, only giving it an estimated wind speed of 205 miles per hour, barely an EF-5. Many, including me, dispute this estimation, but it's up to opinion at that point. To conclude, not much can be learned from this tornado, as it didn't matter if you took the proper precautions. When your house is reduced to a foundation, you have to be underground. There's no other way around it. Once again just like Gerald. 2011 would continue on, however, and it would produce another two EF-5s in El Reno and Joplin. And April 2011 would be the most active month for tornadoes ever, and 2011 as a whole would go on to be the most active tornadic year in recorded history. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing.